Hi, I'm Karin Domstrey from the Embo Journal, and I have the great pleasure of talking with Irv Weissman from Stanford University. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you. So your research has very much focused on stem, stem cell development. Yes. Before we go into your latest research, maybe let's talk about what defines a stem cell and what is the great buzz about stem cell therapies at the moment. Yeah, well, a stem cell is the cell, th the only difference between a stem cell and any other cell in the tissue, when a stem cell gives rise to two daughter cells, on average, half of them are still stem cells, and the other half are moving down to differentiate. Yeah. And if you went for so they're taking on a fate, yeah? That's right. So if you went from a blood-forming stem cell, then to make blood, you may have 16 to 20 cell division. But at that first cell division, you have a cell that at the single cell level can make all blood, but they can't self-renew, so it doesn't last. And that means that the only cell that's important in a blood-forming stem cell transplant, or what people call a bone marrow transplant, or some idiots call a stem cell transplant, is the blood-forming stem cell. Now I know that everybody claims they're doing it, but we're the only ones who have ever actually done a pure blood-forming stem cell transplant. So we sort of got into the uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cell. So a hematopoietic stem cell gives rise to your blood cells and the immune cells. Yes. And so tell me a little bit, where are these hematopoietic stem cells? So in adults, so in me, at healthy adults, yeah. where do the hematopoietic stem cells reside? They're mainly side? in the bone marrow. Okay, and how many does an adult have? Well, an adult mouse has 30,000, so you can multiply times yeah. whatever your weight is different. Yeah. Um, so there are plenty of stem cells there. In mouse systems and in mice that have human immune systems that we've regenerated with tiny numbers of human blood-forming stem cells, they last for the life of the mouse, and then the life of the next mouse on transplantation, okay. then the life of the next mouse. So at the single cell level, even though there are many of them, they are immensely powerful at self-renewal, division, and differentiation. And any insight into humans, if they're sort of the prin same principles, you know, how, long, how long do they last? Or so how long do they survive? We have transplanted women with metastatic breast cancer. Okay where by purifying the stem cells away from all the other cells in the transplant, the, the method of transplant is what's called mobilization. So you have the blood that now has stem cells, and for a woman with cancer, cancer cells, and T and B and all the other blood cells. Okay. We purify those one in 20,000 cells pure. Yes. So we give back those stem cells to the woman after she's gotten a lethal dose of combination chemotherapy. Okay. Rescue her with the thawed pure stem cells. So which basically eliminates? It eliminates their own blood forming system. And then you give a new And it eliminates yeah. most or all of the cancer. And the question was, can we get rid of all of the breast cancer with what was then the current 1996 combination chemotherapy? And the control group or the group that served as controls were people who got the whole mobilized blood back, which was the standard of care. And okay. even, those, even though it wasn't a properly, prospectively randomized trial, the company that bought my company that did this, mm -hmm. my company was Systemics, decided within four years to shut it all down. Before they got the results of the clinical trial, it was a business decision because they weren't going to make enough money in three years to meet their standard. Okay? Yeah. No names included, but I'll just <laughs> say I was disappointed because we were doing the simultaneous trials in myeloma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We were preparing to take healthy blood-forming stem cells okay. from a mother and transplant them into children with severe combined immunodeficiency and next sickle cell yeah. and next thalassemia. Now those diseases haven't gone away. They haven't been cured. The bone marrow transplants that occur now, because they have T cells in them, cause a grave graft versus host disease. Yeah. Pure stem cells don't. Yeah. Okay? So pure stem cells lack cancer contamination. Pure stem cells lack T cells. Now, 15 to 17 years after the beginning of that trial, where only we in the academics are interested, yeah. one third of our women are alive. Those that got mobilized cells, 6% alive, and most of them had disease. Those that had the other fancy great therapies, less than 6%. So it goes without saying that that form of regenerative medicine 
if it was a pill or a protein that they could price would be saving people. Now, yeah. I might be optimistic to say in a very large trial in all metastatic breast cancers, it's going to be the same. But just imagine that it is the same. 50,000 women every year in mm -hmm. the U.S. get that stage of breast cancer, and they have no hope. Yeah. Six percent is the best they can ma imagine. What if it's a third? Those women, who I happened to then meet afterwards, didn't spend a day in the hospital, didn't have another penny of health care for breast cancer. And by the way, they're alive. Yeah. So this is a big point about stem cell therapy. It's foreign to companies that have small molecules. It's foreign to companies that are venture capitalists. It's foreign to the people who are trying to develop biotech. And so they all find a way to get out of it so they're less uncomfortable. Well, so how do you fix a problem like this? So the way we went at fixing it was I was part of a group that in 2004 wrote Proposition 71 in California, the stem cell bill. Yes. And we included in that bill that all kinds of stem cells would be subject to research and funding. Embryonic stem cells, reprogrammed stem cells, cancer stem cells, and each individual tissue stem cell. We've done brain stem cells and we've transplanted them. We've done blood forming stem cells we've transplanted. And for all of those, in an academic environment or even in a small biotech, there's no money to take them through trials. Yeah. So everybody looks for pharma or somebody else to do it. That's the wrong place to look. So we included in Proposition 71 the ability of the state to decide which of the discoveries they would fa fund all the way through A phase one trial. and phase two clinical trials. By that time, you know if there's a toxicity issue yeah. in, well, I'll tell you, all cancers, and if there is any efficacy. So if you just think about that, with that breast cancer, the value of blood-forming stem cells, when we founded the company, was 10 million bucks, right? That's what the company started with. If you were about to treat 50,000 people a year with breast cancer and save, if we're lucky, yeah. a third of them, the value would be in the billions. So short-term business decisions aren't the right approach to this. By the state picking up the funding, and the oversight, same IRB approval, same FDA approval, and we're, you know, considering where we would do it, it becomes a valued property, and better than that, it is a chance for the, for the citizens to benefit from it. So how many do you have now in clinical trial using? So we haven't done the blood forming stem cell yet because I had to get rid of any stock I had with an associated company to then negotiate with the big company that bought my company, which I did. Yeah. And I now have established that we have the antibodies to sort pure blood forming stem okay. cells. We have a pledge, which I hope will come through, from somebody to pay for a stem cell therapy clinic. Okay. At Stanford, non-commercial. Yeah. And we're gonna do all of those experiments. Now, Judy Shizuru, my colleague, is gonna follow on with the breast cancer. We're gonna seek funding for that. but. We've already gotten $20 million, almost, almost finished negotiation from the state to do the children with severe combined immunodeficiency. That does involve one other discovery we made, and that is if you find an antibody that blocks blood forming stem cells from getting the survival signal, yes. called kit ligand or stem cell factor, the stem cells in the body go away. So we can therefore get rid of the stem cells in a kid with severe combined immunodeficiency with no chemotherapy, mm -hmm. no danger of going close to death. And we're going to transplant, following the reduction of those, pure stem cells that can't cause graft versus host disease. Yeah. So hopefully, if it all works, in a year or two we'll be doing that, and then it'll all expand from there. So you were mentioning the amount $20 million. Is that what a clinical trial costs these days? Or what is the to, get to, to get to and file a clinical trial, if you're very good and very efficient, you can do that. Yeah. Companies spend a lot more money, and we can talk about that, but you're going to hit me on CD47, <laughs> so <laughs> I'll give you a much better example. So I would like to sort of get back to the hematopoietic stem cell. 
Uh, because your work has also shown that it actually, if things go wrong in this hematopoietic stem cell, in the self renewal, that it can actually lead to leukemia or cancer. Yeah? Right. Can you sort of explain in the life sure. of a hematopoietic stem cell what sort of goes wrong? Sure. So, in order to find out what went wrong with human blood forming stem cells, we investigated all kinds of human leukemias, the cancers of the blood cells. Yeah. And in 2000, we saw that if there was a particular chromosomal translocation okay. that is a step in making the leukemia, it was in the leukemia, and the leukemia stem cells, the ones that self-renew in the leukemia, weren't at the same stage as the blood-forming stem cell. Okay. They were at that stage of that multipotent progenitor that couldn't self-renew, Yeah. but now it can. So now it becomes super good at... Right. Yeah. But the mutation that we saw the exact translocation that's in the leukemia was present in about 1% of the patient's blood-forming stem cells. When we isolate those, they're not leukemic. They have about 8 to 10 steps before they cause the leukemia. And we just finished a study where we showed in all of the acute myelogenous leukemias we've studied, we find the genetic mutations by doing genome sequencing of the leukemia stem cell and from the same patient, we get individual blood-forming stem cells, and we found in these patients, everyone, ones that have only the first mutation. So you're sort of tracking the evolution and of it. And then the next yeah. one, we have the first and the second until we go all the way. And the pre-leukemic development is in the only self-renewing cells in the bone marrow normally, yeah. the blood-forming stem cells. But then when they switch with whatever the last event is to a leukemia, it always comes out as a downstream progenitor. Now. That leads to a nice scientific hypothesis that says, well, the number of blood-forming stem cells has to be so rigidly controlled that even a cancer can't defeat it. And it has to be a progenitor mm -hmm. that now can self-renew, yeah. have long lifespan, extend its telomeres, avoid programmed cell death, and especially avoid programmed cell removal Yes. in order to be a leukemia. And, and so I guess the cell sort of in a way becomes the cancer stem cell, is that correct? That is the cancer stem cell, but it's not a cancer of stem cells. By what I'm saying yeah. is the progression in leukemia occurs in stem cells. I'll bet any amount of body money to anybody <laughs> who wants to listen to me, it'll be the same in brain, in breast, in lung, and every cancer that we get. That is, progression will occur in the normal stem cell, but the cancer will emerge at a downstream progenitor that now can self-renew. And so if you look in a tumor, uh, how many cancer stem cells are there actually in a tumor? And uh, is it a heterogeneous pool or is it a... Yeah, so anytime anybody looks at a cancer, like on a microscopic slide, yeah. you see a whole bunch of different kinds of cells that include the cancer genes mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of other cells that rush in to either fight or help the cancer yeah. grow. When we look at the genome sequence of that, we can see the mutations, because the daughter cells will always inherit the mutations. Mm -hmm. But what you can't tell is what are the changes that are inherited changes in gene expression yeah. that don't involve mutations, because they too contribute to the development of the cancer. And to do that, you have to purify the cancer stem cells. So you will know for every cancer yeah. how many there are yeah. and what they can do. Usually, they're about 5 to 10% of the cells in a cancer. Yeah. Not the one in a million that some people proposed yeah. earlier, but about 5 to 10%. So when we did that in a disease called chronic myelogenous leukemia, which was initiated with a translocation, BCR to ABLE, but then it only kills you when it goes to the acute phase called myeloid blast crisis. Sorry for the words. It's okay. <laughs> right? But in acute leukemia, we had to purify the cancer stem cell there to find out the genetic change that made them go from an indolent to an aggressive. Yeah. And that one turned on what's called the beta-catenin pathway, and it had misspliced an enzyme, so it took out the part of an enzyme that would phosphorylate beta-catenin for its destruction. So, now so it's by doing to that, we could find not only what the progression was, but the mechanism of moving from chronic slow, treated by to Gleevec, yeah. to something aggressive. that Gleevec can't yeah. touch. Um, I want to briefly get into your very recent work on CD47 yeah. because that has really great therapeutic implications. Right. So can you please uh, briefly ex explain? Sure. So way back in 1998, we had looked at our mouse leukemias, where we had isolated the mouse leukemia stem cell, David Traver and I, 
according and the normal cell counterparts mm -hmm. in the same genetic mouse. And CD47 popped up. And it's a transmembrane protein, yeah? So it's it's yeah. a transmembrane protein, and nobody knew what it did. And I would ask people what it did. And I'm slow at reading the literature, but I did notice a paper in Science a couple years later from Oldenburg and Lindbergh in Stockholm that it's an age marker on mouse red blood cells. Okay. As long as it's there, the red cells not only stay alive and stay in the circulation, but they avoid being eaten by the macrophages, the eating cells. Well, Oldenburg, not us, showed it was a don't eat me signal, that it interacted with a receptor on macrophages called a signaling receptor, SERP alpha. And that shut off the ability of the macrophage to eat the cell to which it's attached. So in a way, it's a survival signal, right. yeah? And it took me about five or six years of constant begging my lab, and I mean begging, to get somebody to work on it. But then from the time we started working on it, Sid Jaiswal, Mark Chow, and especially Ravi Majetti and I, showed first, it's on human leukemia, all leukemia. Second, it's on all human cancers. Third, it's a don't eat me signal. Fourth, if we put a neutralizing antibody that blocks it, it gets eaten. So we began just a few years ago transplanting authentic human leukemias from patients directly into immune deficient mm -hmm. mice. Let it grow up until the leukemia was burning away. Yeah. Treated it for three weeks with an antibody and cured 90%. We went on and showed that it was on in lymphomas and then in all cancers. And we showed, especially with lymphomas, that it was, um, you could treat a lymphoma with a standard antibody called rituximab, and it would go away, but then the cancer would come back, the human cancer transplanted yeah. to the mouse. We gave our antibody, this was a really aggressive lymphoma, it went away, but then it came back. We gave the combination of our antibody and rituximab and cured them. And we showed that rituximab was acting as an eat me signal. When it bound to the leukemia cell, the back end of the antibody, the macrophage recognized yeah. and had a phagocytic receptor to pull us in. Now, when we looked at all the normal tissues of the body, many of them had CD47, but they were never eaten when we gave antibody to neutralize it. And luckily, uh, my daughter, a high school student, Rachel, <laughs> and Sid Jaiswal and Mark Chow, who read the literature better than I did, found that a great eat me signal was calreticulin and we showed calreticulin is the eat me signal for human leukemias and lymphomas and many but not all cancers and that when you block the don't eat me signal it reveals the eat me signal yeah so but that normal cells don't have the eat me signal maybe one percent do but you can lose one percent of your normal cells yeah here you lose a hundred percent of the cancer cells. so you're specifically talking to right cells, yeah? so we decided obviously that we wanted to be able to take these therapies to humans. And then that Proposition 71, California Institute of Regenerative Medicine came in, and we applied for a grant, and we didn't get a great score, but close enough, they decided to fund us. So we, we, Ravi Majetti, Mark Chow, and the group, took the antibody we had, and we hired a team of people to help us move it. Uh, 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 J. Lu, who had worked on yeah. making humanized antibodies. Maureen Howard, who had lots of experience as the, the lead mm -hmm. scientific officer in many companies. Susie Prohaska, who came up through my lab, but was terrific at these kinds of things. And we have developed a team that has moved. First, we humanized the antibody. Then we made an artificial immunoglobulin, human immunoglobulin back end that wouldn't be seen by macrophages, so we wouldn't destroy normal yeah. cells. So we used IgG4. We've taken it through monkey trials. It's barely toxic, and the only toxicity we see, we can get rid of completely. So we can, in fact, dose them to a level that we would give patients and reach 100 times the therapeutic level and sustain it. Yeah. We've shown that that new antibody works even better on every primary human cancer we've looked at. I forgot to tell you, it works on every human so cancer. So it's not just cancers linked to the right. blood, yeah? So then we wanted to look, how could we do these trials within our budget and efficiently? When we first announced that we were doing this for leukemias, that we'd found this, uh, Paresh Vias, uh, an MD, PhD at Oxford, said, we want to do it with you. So I said to Paresh, okay, that's great. You know, we, you're a great team and all that. 
why should we do it with you? And he says, okay, <laughs> how many leukemia patients are you going to get at Stanford in the first year of your trial? I say, well, there'll probably be 30 or 40 eligible for trials, and if I get 10 competing with the big companies, yeah. I'll be lucky. And by the way, each patient will be costly because we have to have a whole team of people negotiating with everybody's different insurance company to do the trial. Yeah. And so Paresh said, well, Alan Burnett, Charles Craddock, and I many years ago formed a team to do acute myelogenous leukemia trials. We draw from all patients in the UK. Our insurance company is the National Health Service. So you're dealing with the one negotiation person. is yeah. over. Yeah. They want to do this. And we can deliver to you 50 new patients every week, not 10 in a year. Yeah. So we got it. And we've managed, and I mean it's been a little difficult, to form a combine where now the Medical Research Council will fund their leukemia part of the trial. Uh -huh. Probably Cancer Research UK, I hope, will fund their solid tumor type of the trial and will provide all of the infrastructure to carry that as if we were a biotech company yeah. to registration, to yeah. FDA and MHRA trials. And we've got our own team at Stanford. Yeah. So now we've found with these two teams that we had to overcome bureaucratic hurdles and it hasn't, I mean it takes a little bit, but it's not impossible. So now we're gonna be in the situation that at two universities, for the first time at both universities, we will have a discovery from one of the universities go through clinical trial at the university. Yeah. And at the end of the clinical trials, we can all discuss how our universities will license it out. But I know this, I'm not gonna let some board of directors at a highly <laughs> commercial company make a decision based on their imperfect knowledge of what science is and where science is going. This is a different game. Yeah. And the important thing that I think the people should understand from this, this is the game. Yeah. States will have to take over funding where commercial entities don't. Commercial entities, to be in the game even late, are going to have to modify how they do things. They can't have a three to five year turnaround because yeah. it ain't going to be that way. Yeah. And they got to put in more money to enjoy the benefits. Now, I don't expect them to change their, their important credo. The goal of a company is to make a profit. Sure. I want we who say the goal of Biomedical research is to advance medical science for people to at least be included in that. Yeah. And that means we have to be on the boards. We have to help control. So there's a whole bunch of issues that come up between universities and commercialization that need to be worked out. But look at how far we've gone. Well, it sounds very Since we had yeah? that trial with yeah. the breast cancer that nearly killed me. And lastly, I want to get your thoughts on sort of these commercial stem cell therapies that are fair to say it's unproven yeah that are available set yes yeah. so what are your thoughts on this and, and yeah. what can scientists do better to sort of inform people yeah so when I was um, on the council of the international well, maybe we should first explain what I'll are these explain yeah, what they are, good. yeah well I began by looking googling stem cell and therapy and if all of you do that you will see the first 200 responses turn out to be therapies that have not been proven scientifically, likely therapies that never protected the patient during clinical trials by an institutional yeah. review board, likely therapies that didn't go through an FDA or its equivalent to show not only it lack of toxicity, but efficacy yeah. better than whatever else is there. Yeah. So we made a website, the International Stem Cell Society, which said, we're not gonna investigate those people, we're just asking two questions. When you were developing your product, give us the name of the IRB that oversaw the safety of the patients during your trial. So and the IRB is what? Institutional Review Board. They are independent people, independent of the doctors who are doing the trial, so people that independent of the patients, yeah? independent of commercial organization in the best possible setting, although some people even try to yeah. game that. And then the FDA, of course, is to say it's both safe and efficacious. Mm -hmm. So when we just said we're going to put that up on the website and we're just going to ask those two questions and our, even the lawyers on our site is fine, somebody came up with um, a letter saying by what authority are you asking these questions of my doctor? 
and the group retreated. Now, as a consequence, companies that claim they have mesenchymal stem cells that can cure everything have actually fibroblast cultures, only a few of which might be stem cells. Yeah. And we showed before, and unfortunately it's being shown clinically, those cannot turn into heart, they cannot turn into brain, they cannot turn into muscle, can't turn into lung, they can't regenerate systems. They might have immunosuppressive properties, usually they don't, so they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. But they're charging 50 to 150,000 bucks a treatment. Now, all of those were taking advantage of weak regulatory environments in countries that don't have these strong regulatory. Although sometimes the therapies in our countries like Germany and Israel, which should have perfectly good, yeah. and Texas, excuse me, <laughs> another country, um, but they're not regulated and people are, it's so much money is being made from it, they're battling it. So we are taking this to the International Academies of Sciences through the National Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Medicine to get a large enough group that's international enough along with the International Stem Cell Society to say, can we solve this problem? Now it doesn't help that in Italy an unproven therapy was just established as a commercial therapy by the government. By the government, yeah. By the government. And so a lot of people are trying to get them to turn around. It doesn't help that the Vatican supports false statements about the ability of blood forming stem cells or other cells in the blood to become any tissue in the body. Yeah. The Vatican does. Yeah. So we've got a couple very powerful Europe centric organizations that are making this difficult. But you know, I have hopes. I just visited, visited Thailand uh -huh. and their, their Ministry of Health and their oversight FDA, the Thai FDA, have both put in pretty strong rules of how you do things and penalties if you don't do it. We'll okay. see if they can do it. Unfortunately, Texas just allowed uh, company associated IRBs, if they get the approval from the Texas Medical, Medical Board to, to go ahead and do therapies. So we have to investigate all of them. I just hate to think of Thailand as being <laughs> Better than Texas. Sort of below the U.S., <laughs> but above Texas. <laughs> well, on that note, thank you for a really wonderful talk. Good. Thank, thank you. you.